Welcome back. Today we're doing another retrospective, but not Five Nights at Freddy's. The Sister Location video is coming next. But today we're talking about one of my favorite games of all time, Little Nightmares. Now we're not separating this into different videos for each game. We're talking about it all. Little Nightmares 1, 2, the mobile prequel, Very Little Nightmares, the comics, all of it. If you can think of it, we're talking about it. There's going to be a focus on the lore and my theories on the series, but there's also going to be talk about the characters and the monsters and some visual and gameplay stuff too. The goal of this video is to take you from someone who doesn't know anything about Little Nightmares to being an expert on it. And even if you do know about Little Nightmares, maybe you can learn something new. I was first introduced to Little Nightmares with a very early trailer. Back then, the game was called Hunger. I'm sure you can see why they changed the name if you look up Hunger Game. I specifically remember the sound design sticking out to me, this creepy vocal sound. Also, the chef's design in this trailer ended up inspiring the design for Chef Poe in my game Alphabet Lane. I was obsessed with this trailer for a long time. It was just the perfect aesthetic for a horror game. But for more than a year, I didn't hear anything about it. Until unrelated, I stumbled across a trailer for a game called Little Nightmares and went... Wait, I recognize that. The game was released on April 28th, 2017 by Bandai Namco and the game was made by Tarzir Studios. It wasn't the biggest game in the world, but it quickly grew a cult following and there was some interesting overlap with the Five Nights at Freddy's community because the story was so vague and intriguing that it inspired theory video after theory video. I have played this game many times, first for a let's play and then multiple times after that. But after the first game, a lot of other things came out. The mobile prequel, Very Little Nightmares, comics, a live action show was announced, and then eventually Little Nightmares 2. So with that set up, let's get into it. There are three main locations in the Little Nightmares world. The Maw, the Pale City, and the Nest. There are other areas in the comics, but they're not quite as important, and we'll cross that bridge when we get there. For now, let's talk about the main three. The Maw. This is where the entirety of the first game takes place. It's very spirited away. Here's the official quote. The Maw arrives every year, always at the same time, but never in the same place. It creeps and crawls and buries its claws deep beneath the glistening water, and there it sits in vast silence, waiting. Soon after, they start to arrive. The guests, the monstrous, sweating, hungry guests. All seems bursting, bodies bulging, eyes dead with boredom. They shuffle up the gangway and into the mouth of the Maw, and then they are no more. For none of those that enter have ever returned to tell the tale. At least, not yet. Like I said, spirited away. As you first play through the first Little Nightmares and the subsequent DLC, there are quite a few different areas. First, the prison. This is where the children are kept in the bowels of the Maw. It is a strange mixture of a school, prison, and livestock cages. This is where our main character, Six, starts. Mainly, it's just populated by these eyes, keep eyes in mind, leeches and children. And it's also where we're introduced to our first main antagonist, the janitor, who takes kids from there to the next area, the lair. The lair is a mixture of a processing area and a library. As we encounter the enemy here, we realize that it's likely that he lives here. The children in the prison are moved through the lair to be processed to be moved to the next area, the kitchen. The kitchen is where the food is prepared. You can guess what one of the biggest ingredients is. Here, the meals are prepared and moved to the guest area. This is the dining area where the guests enter from boats and gorge themselves on the food. Watching from above is the lady. This is where we're introduced to the residence, the living space for the character that owns the maw. Then there's the hideaway and the depths. The hideaway is where the furnaces are operated and the depths are likely close to the kitchen and prison and may have been a living quarters in the past. Now, it's just a flooded mess of pipes and rotted wood. The Pale City. Here is where the second game takes place. A city on the coast clearly falling apart and under the control of the signal tower. So let's take a look. Before you even enter the city, the game starts in the wilderness, a dense dark forest filled with traps across the water from the Pale City. 
It seems like it was once more inhabited, but clearly it isn't as populated as it once was. Moving across the water, you enter the city near the school. Here is where strange porcelain children are educated. Exactly the process of the city and the school aren't as clear as the Ma. After the school, you enter the hospital, a mix of a mental institution and a hospital. A large, dilapidated building filled with body parts and mannequins. From there, you move on to the quarters of the city, filled with apartments and housing areas. Clearly, this place used to be filled with people and shopping centers, full apartments and buildings. Now, it's all abandoned and dilapidated, but there are some people left. We'll get into that. From here, you make your way to the signal tower, a large tower that seems to be broadcasting something that controls those in the city. It's surreal, and things don't quite work the way they should inside. The Nest. This place comes from the mobile game that came between Little Nightmares 1 and 2. This one isn't set up into chapters like the others, so generally it's not specific places, it's just one big building, a mansion on the top of a mountain, with kitchens, storage areas, etc. One thing to note is that it seems like aircraft of most kinds, planes, hot air balloons, are prone to crashing here. So that's the world where Little Nightmares takes place. Now let's move on to the creatures that inhabit this world, the monsters. Keep in mind, this isn't all the characters, just the monsters or antagonists. Let's start with the first game. The leeches and eyes are two of the smaller enemies that exist in the game, so we'll group them together. The leeches are just that, giant, gooey leeches, and the eyes are glowing stone eyes that turn the player into stone. Now let's talk a bit bigger. The janitor is a long-armed, blind caretaker of the prison and the lair. He keeps track of the children and prepares them, either collecting their stone versions as toys or preparing them to be sent to the kitchen. He can't see, so instead he relies on sound, and it seems to be implied, smell. As we see throughout the game, tall characters seem to be seen as the regular. However, it almost seems like he got a cartoon bowling ball dropped on his head with his short legs and long arms. And again, like many characters in this game, his skin almost seems like a mask falling off of his gray metal-like head. In the game's files, he's known as Roger, which might hint at a past for this character. The official description is, with long forgotten things from long forgotten places, he fled the world and found the Maw. Now as the janitor, he is a tall tale hiding in the shadows, stalking the silence, a monster alone. In a more gameplay sense, he appears in different areas and can most easily be outsmarted by creating distracting sounds, throwing objects, moving in time with louder sounds, things like that. Between the janitor and the next big monster is the shoe monster, an unseen creature that chases the character through a pile of shoes. It reminds me of the water monster from Amnesia. Something very similar appears in Very Little Nightmares called the dump monster, which does the same thing as a shoe monster but in a trash heap. Best way to beat it? run. Moving through the maw, you get into the kitchen where you meet the twin chefs. Judging by the first trailer, there may have been originally three, but now there's just two. Clearly wearing masks as well, wiping sweat from beneath, both of them take the food, fish, sausage, children, and prepare it, clean the dishes, and keep vermin out of their kitchen. Unlike the janitor, the chefs can see, but don't quite have the reach of the janitor. Officially, the chefs are described with a love of violence and a feeling for meat, the twins were born to be chefs. They shuffle across the cold floor, chopping, mincing, preparing the feast. The twin chefs sent something that make their skin itch, a dirty, unwelcome presence. Vermin will not be tolerated in the kitchen. They use anything from hammers to cleavers and will not hesitate to turn them on intruders. Again, in a gameplay sense, the chefs are a little harder to escape. Most of the time you're walking right through their kitchen with them there, so your best bet is to find a dark corner to hide in and get out of their reach. The chefs prepare their food for the guests. These are large, endlessly hungry customers of the Maw. They're not very fast, smart, or strong, but they do have one thing on their side. Numbers. Dozens, if not hundreds, of guests come onto the ship at once and endlessly feast. But seemingly, by their motivation to eat our main character, Live Child is a delicacy. The official description is, The guests are an essential part of the Ma's life cycle. Herded into the large hall, they slump onto their bowing stools and there they feed. Without taste, without need, without end. And then they leave, one way or another. In a gameplay sense, hiding from that many characters is not feasible. Instead, use their own weight against them. It's not hard to outsmart them. Now we'll talk about the character who watches over the entire Maw, the Lady. A tall woman in a mask watches over the entire operation. Clearly, she has more power than she seems and is gaining some of the power from the Maw itself, a symbiotic relationship. 
The official description is, With graceful restraint, the lady casts the hypnotic spell that keeps the engine running. Amidst the chaos of the world outside, the Ma is the only place that makes sense, and now, this rumor of an escaped child threatens everything. Nothing can be allowed to interfere. The guests must eat. The Ma must survive. Gameplay-wise, she's not in gameplay very often, generally all you can do is run, and remember this, the lady doesn't like mirrors. I should also mention the lady has the power to transform children into gnomes, which we'll talk about next, even though they're not really enemies. Gnomes, while not being enemies, I think are important to mention here. Created by the lady from misbehaving children, they work in the hideaway to operate the furnaces that fuel the maw. I guess that's what they meant by casting a hypnotic spell that keeps the engine running. Stray gnomes can be found throughout the whole Maw and become very important as we move through the story. And to cap off the first game, we have the Granny. She appears as really the only new monster in the two DLC for the first game, The Secrets of the Maw. The Granny is a monstrous old woman who prefers to live in the water. Lanky and quick, it's important to stay at arm's length from this monster. Exactly her origin or purpose is unclear, but she seems to have been alive for a long time. Gameplay wise, just remember this, she can't come out of the water, you can. Moving on to the monsters of Very Little Nightmares, the mobile prequel to the first game. Let's talk about these a little quickly because we've already been here for a while. The Craftsman is a long-limbed man strapped to a wheelchair. While he doesn't quite have the reach of the janitor, he can still reach pretty high. However, if you stay out of sight, he can't exactly look around due to his restrictions. The butler is a hunched and bound telekinetic being who does the house chores around the nest. Because of his telekinetic powers, it's best just to not be seen. The pretender doesn't look like the typical enemy for this game series. Another child about the same size as the player in a fancy dress and smeared lipstick. Her part isn't quite as gameplay oriented, more of a scripted chase, but here's what I'll say. Don't let her small size deceive you. Moving on, let's talk about the newest game, Little Nightmares 2. Starting with the first enemy you encounter, the hunter. A lone inhabitant of the forest, the hunter seems to have a knack for killing all living things and stuffing them, making himself company for his loneliness. The official description reads, Armed with a flashlight and his battered shotgun, the hunter stamps through the wilderness with cold ambition, stiffing out his prey, collecting new trophies for the groaning walls of his shack. He's very Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Gameplay-wise, he's very accurate with his shotgun. It's best to get to cover and stay out of the light. Next is the teacher. She's a strict school teacher who educates the unruly students. With a long, growing neck, it's hard to escape her view. The official description is, misbehavior will not be tolerated in the teacher's classroom, and nothing escapes her cold, twisted gaze. In her domain, children should be seen and not heard. And if one is heard, they will never be seen again. Gameplay-wise, it's best to distract her if you need to and hide in a dark corner if you don't. She's mostly preoccupied with her work. The bullies are the porcelain students of the school. Mean-spirited and just as happy to hurt each other as they are the player, these are some of the only enemies you can fight back against. The official description is, Proof that all children don't get to be innocent, the bullies aren't tragic figures nor cruel parents to blame, and they don't secretly crave your friendship. They are bullies, and they will get you if you don't get them first. Gameplay-wise, it's hard to get these guys to ignore you, unless you have a disguise, grab a weapon, and get ready to fight. They're a little fragile, being made of porcelain and all. The patients are a strange mix of false limbs, mannequin parts, and flesh. Most of them look different and unique. They're the creations of the doctor. The official description is, The patients cannot live with themselves. They look in the mirror and hate what stares back. Seeing nothing but the flaws and ugliness of nature, they beg the doctor to fix them, to work his magic and make them whole again. For gameplay, remember this, they can't move in the light. Use that to your advantage, flashlight or not. This one is fast, the living hands. They're spider-like hands which are really creepy, but you can defeat pretty easily with a well-placed thwack. The doctor is a strange, gravity-defying monster who seems to actually care about his patients, but not your well-being. In fact, he wants to kill you. The official description is, Perfection is important to the doctor, and he will not allow anything to interfere with his life's work. With his adoring patients clattering the halls, you may not hear the doctor coming until it's too late. Only then will you learn to look up to him. The key to beating him? Just remember that he really does care about his patients, maybe enough to impede his better judgment. The viewers are the inhabitants of the Pale City, distorted by and obsessed with the strange broadcast that spreads throughout the city. They get very angry if anything interrupts their viewing. The official description is, The viewers live life through the screen and cannot imagine a world without it. 
All those wonderful colors, sounds, and shapes dancing before their eyes, mesmerizing them, pacifying them, fattening them up. The transmission gives them all they need, and demands only one thing in return. They're really only in it for the TV. If there's another TV nearby and you need to get by, just switch their attention. And finally, the Thin Man. A strange, tall-suited man with a hat and an uncanny ability to control the broadcast. Or is the broadcast controlling him? Either way, he's very powerful and can use telekinetic abilities to capture you. The description is, As the ever-present hum of the transmission chokes the airwaves, the thin man continues his endless journey through the desolate place, haunting the shadows, searching for something. He can use the TVs to get around and steal people away to a television dimension. Gameplay-wise, run. But don't rule out beating him another way, too. Okay, so that was really long. Let's pick things up a bit. Let's talk about the characters the player will control throughout the game series, and a couple that they meet along the way. In the first Little Nightmares, you take control of a girl in a yellow raincoat named Six. It seems likely that she has some connection to the Maw, but it's hard to get into that without getting into theory territory. Despite being so small and seemingly innocent, Six has a darker side and has no qualms with fighting back when possible. She also seems to be haunted by an unnatural hunger, ergo the original name for the game. She also appears shortly in Very Little Nightmares and as an NPC in Little Nightmares 2. The Runaway Kid is who the player controls in the Little Nightmares DLC. Less of a loner, but just as willing to protect himself, the runaway seems to have broken away from the prison and is now trying to escape. The girl in the yellow raincoat is not Six. It's a little confusing, but it seems most obvious that after the events of Very Little Nightmares, Six ends up taking this character's raincoat. A traveler of some kind, after her hot air balloon crashes into the nest, she spends her time trying to escape and help others along the way. And then there's the Shadow Children. These are antagonists in the Little Nightmares DLC, but also appear in different forms throughout the series. The Glitched Remains, Shadow Six, etc. Exactly how they got to be the way they are isn't clear or consistent. Sometimes they sit still, presumably in the same place they were when they were turned into shadows. Sometimes they work for people like the Lady. And in the case of Shadow Six, they seem to have some sort of power or a sort of alter ego of someone. And finally, there's Mono, the protagonist of the first game. A boy with a bag on his head, he's clearly very motivated and unlike a character like Six, is a little more prone to helping others. In his official description, it says he uses his mask to hide from a world that hates him. Everyone wants him to fail. That will make more sense as we get into story. Now that you know the cast of characters, the monsters that they've faced, and the world that they inhabit, let's get onto the plot of the games. We'll start basic, just the main plot points that happen throughout the games, then we'll get into an interpreted timeline of events. That is when the theory crafting comes in. Little Nightmares 1 starts with Six waking from a dream of the lady. From here, she makes her way through the prison and runs into her first bout of hunger. Luckily, a friendly child gives Six some bread to stave it off for a bit. She dodges more leeches and stone eyes until she is hit with another bout of hunger and is lured into a cage by the janitor with a piece of meat. Waking up in the lair, Six escapes and witnesses the janitor wrapping children up and sending them down a conveyor belt. After numerous close calls with the janitor, Six eventually is able to escape and chop his arms off in a door. From here, she moves to the kitchen where she is once again overtaken by hunger. The stakes begin to raise as Six eats a live rat caught in a trap. From here, she dodges and escapes the chefs until she finally reaches the guest area where the food is being served to hundreds of bloated customers. After being nearly eaten by the guests, she gets hungry again. A friendly gnome, Six has encountered gnomes and even helped them throughout the game up to this point, offers her some food. But instead of eating it, she attacks the gnome and eats him instead. While Shadow Six is technically visible in other parts while Six is eating, here is where she's most visible, standing over and watching. Moving on, Six encounters the lady in the residence. Six dodges her a few times until she gets to a final battle sequence, battling the lady with a mirror. After shining the reflection at her enough times, the lady falls to the ground, and Six is filled with the hunger yet again. Six begins to eat the lady and seems to gain some sort of power from it. From here, she moves back to the guest area and uses her newfound power to kill the guests and walk out. In the after credits segment, we can see Six at the top of the maw sitting there. 
The end. The Secrets of the Ma DLC, the collective name for the Little Nightmares 1 DLCs, goes like this in chronological order. First, the runaway kid wakes up from a nightmare of being pulled underwater. He wakes up and finds his way out of the prison and escapes to the depths. Using a flashlight, he finds the runaway kid runs through the dark, flooded depths, escaping leeches and eventually the granny. Finally, he escapes the granny by dropping a TV into the waters, electrocuting her. From here, the runaway kid is captured by the janitor and escapes into the hideaway with the furnaces. After escaping here, the runaway kid makes his way to the residence, aka the ladies' quarters. Here, he's attacked by the shadow children and stumbles into a room where the lady is looking at her reflection. Now we can see her without her mask, which seems to be considerably distorted. The lady captures him and transforms him into a gnome. And finally, at the end, it's revealed that the runaway kid is the very same gnome that Six eats at the end of the first game. Goddamn. For very little nightmares, the girl in the yellow raincoat crashes into the nest and makes her way through the mansion, avoiding harm and helping other children. At the end, she encounters the Pretender, but with the help of a girl dressed in white, she's able to defeat her. Or not, as the Pretender gets up and sends both the Pretender and the girl in the raincoat off the cliff. Now the raincoat floats on the surface of the water as the girl in white walks down the mountain. It's implied here that Six is actually the girl in white, and that's where Six gets the raincoat. Alright, let's talk about the newest game, Little Nightmares 2. Mana wakes up in a forest from a dream about a strange hallway with a door with an eye on it. From here, Mano makes his way through the forest and avoids traps, eventually stumbling across the hunter's cabin. Here he finds Six, without her raincoat, trapped inside. Six seems cautious at first, but they eventually begin working together, escaping the hunter and shooting the hunter with a shotgun. Crossing the water on a wooden door, they enter the Pale City. As the story goes along, TVs begin seemingly calling to Mano, and Mano can enter them, moving toward the door from his dream. Before he can make it through though, Six pulls him out. The pair make their way through the school where Six is captured by the bullies, but is rescued by Mano. Here is when we start to see Six's darker side, breaking a bully with her bare hands. Escaping the teacher, Mano and Six make it back into the city, where Six finds her raincoat on the ground. Escaping through the hospital, they burn the doctor in a furnace and make their way back out into the city where Mono is once again called to a TV. This time though, he makes it to the end. He opens the door and the thin man is on the other side. Six pulls Mono out, but the thin man has now been released, capturing Six and chasing Mono. After escaping the thin man multiple times, Mono removes his mask and begins to fight back. It turns out Mono has powers too. After defeating the Thin Man, Mono travels to the Signal Tower, where he encounters a shifted reality. Inside, Six has been transformed into a monster, clutching a music box that seems to bring her comfort. To change her back, Mono must destroy the music box, which causes Six to be angry. Eventually, Mono succeeds, and the two attempt to escape a strange wall of flesh that inhabits the Signal Tower. Or, probably more accurately, is the Signal Tower. Six moves ahead and makes it to an exit, and Mono jumps to grab her hand. Instead of pulling him up, however, Six drops him and escapes. Now, in a strange world of ice and flesh, Mono finds a chair and sits down. And here, he grows up and eventually turns into the Thin Man. If you collect all the glitched remains throughout the game, there's a secret ending in which Six falls out of a TV after escaping the signal tower and is met face to face with Shadow Six. Shadow Six points down to a drawing of the Maw, and Six's hunger returns. The end. So, that's how the games go. But as you might be able to tell, there's more here than meets the eye. So, with all of that evidence provided, what do I think really happened here, and in what order? That's what we'll get into next, with evidence as to why I think this. Alright, let's go. Alright, from here on out, I'll have an indicator in the corner that looks like this, that has different levels on how sure I am, from completely confident that this is what happened, to just my own personal interpretation. Let's go. Very Little Nightmares starts the timeline off. The girl in the raincoat, a traveler of some kind, crashes into the nest. Unfortunately, she isn't able to escape the clutches of the pretender and plummets to her death, her raincoat washing away. Six, also a prisoner of the nest, is able to escape and washes up on the shore of the forest where the hunter captures her. Here, she stays captured for a while until Mono finds her and frees her. Along their adventure through the Pale City in the second game, Mono is drawn to these TVs, which clearly have some supernatural power. Six attempts to pull him back to reality as she seems to understand that there's something sinister going on here. Along the way, Six finds the raincoat that her old friend used to wear, which washed up on shore at some point and then made its way to the trash of the city. Finally, after 
trying to save Mono from whatever is pulling him to the TV, Six isn't able to, and Mono releases the Thin Man who captures her. Mono, either revealing or discovering his powers, defeats the Thin Man and saves Six from her now monstrous state that the Thin Man transformed her into. As the two attempt to escape the signal tower, a monstrous, extra-dimensional being that has been using the Thin Man to transform others into monsters and control them, Six drops Mono, betraying him. The obvious thought here is that Six is somehow evil, but I don't think that's the case. Mono, who clearly had some connection with the TVs, literally set the Thin Man free after Six tried multiple times to stop him. Throughout the game, she pulls him out knowing that nothing good can come from it. Then, Mono lets this guy loose by opening the door, and he transforms her into a monster. In her mind, Mono betrayed her. Watch Six and Mono's demeanor here. Six is clearly trying to get Mono's attention and leave, while Mono starts moving toward the TV. Six knows something bad is happening, and Mono is ignoring her and is drawn to whatever is in the TV. There's also something else going on here. As we know, after Mono is dropped into the pit, he transforms into the Thin Man. Throughout the game, until the very end, Mono is wearing a bag on his head. This end portion is the first time Six can get a good look at his face while holding him to pull him up. And here is where she makes the realization. He is the Thin Man. Maybe she doesn't quite understand how it works, but she recognizes his face as the same one, just younger, that captured her and transformed her. While we all feel bad for Mono, I think Six is probably justified here. She knows better than anyone that the children of this world can be just as dangerous as the monsters. Back to Mono falling, here is where he transforms into the Thin Man. This introduces something to the series that's very important, the aspect of time loops. Most people agree here that Little Nightmares 2 is a time loop. Mono as the Thin Man attempts to save young Mono from Six by capturing Six and ending the cycle. But every time, young Mono wins and the cycle continues. Thin Man tries to stop Mono from turning into the Thin Man, Mono wins, Mono is betrayed, and we're back to the Thin Man. Time loop. Meanwhile, Six escapes, but something isn't right. Something changed when she was turned into a monster. An emptiness. A hunger and something else. The remains of the TV, the glitched remains. Now she has her own shadow child that is somehow attached to her, and it led her to the Maw where she is able to satisfy her new hunger. She's ferried to the Maw from the city, but unfortunately, the Maw doesn't serve children. It serves children. <laughs> In tandem with her story as she navigates the Maw, the runaway kid is trying to escape, and the two run into each other a few times. Unfortunately, it ends for the runaway kid when he's eaten in his gnome form by Six. This dark hunger surrounding her is taking over, and she eventually kills the lady, absorbing her power, and eventually absorbing the power of the guests too. In my mind, the natural progression here is Six turning into the lady. Maybe not as direct as Mono turns into the thin man, but instead, Six takes her place. When Little Nightmares first came out, a lot of people thought that these paintings were Six, and that she was the lady's daughter. Instead, I think this was the lady as a child. I'm not alone in this thought that the lady is a mantle claimed by multiple people throughout time. The nest, in my view, is where the next lady is raised. The pretender is going to take the place of the lady eventually, but died along with the girl in the raincoat. Now, Six takes her place instead. Similar to the Thin Man, although less time-dimension-y, the Ma is a cycle. To me, this is backed up by the existence of the Granny. We're not exactly sure what she's doing there. Unlike the rest of the Ma, she doesn't really have a purpose. But look at how the lady's face looks in the mirror here without a mask. Very similar to the Granny. I don't think they're the same person, though. I think that the Granny is a previous lady, which was then replaced by the current lady, who was then replaced by Six. Unlike the lady here, the granny just retired, likely becoming too corrupted to continue. There's also the motif of eyes that surrounds the game. The maw, the nest, the pale city. To me, I think these eyes, the wall of flesh and eyes, are the puppet masters. They give power to things like the maw, and the thin man, and the lady. Unfortunately, this power also corrupts them. Children like Six seemed somehow resistant to it, and that's why they're such a target. They can't be controlled as easily. Mono, unfortunately, is lured and transforms into a monster himself. This is likely because he's already had some power to begin with, as we see. Sort of similar to Six after she's transformed into a monster. Even after turning back, there's some mysterious aura surrounding her, and she isn't satisfied until she consumes the lady by taking her power. And power craves power. A hunger.
And here's where the comics come in. They complicate things. A lot. When Six gets her raincoat, how she gets to the Maw, to the Pale City. So I understand that using the comics, a very different story could be told. And there's a lot that is referenced in the comics that doesn't even show up in the games at all, like the North Wind and the mirrors and things like that. But in order to create a satisfying story for the games, from the games, this is what I came up with, with a little boost or help from certain scenes in the comics. So, what's next for the series? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't look great. Tarzir Studios has decided to leave the IP behind, although Bandai Namco has said they might still work on content for it. A few years ago, there was an announcement that there was going to be a TV series uh, directed by the same person who directed Nightmare Before Christmas and Coraline, and then it was going to have the Russo brothers working on it, but Nothing has come out about that since it was announced years ago. It could still happen, but there's been no news or evidence that progress is being made. That's not to say there's no hope though. Little Nightmares 2 has brought a whole new wave of fans to the game, and again, Bandai Namco still says they want to do something more with the IP. I'm not exactly sure how that'll go without the original studio, but I'm interested to see what they do. Either way, what we have so far has been great, so even if the series ends here, it's still pretty fantastic. Okay, so it feels weird doing a retrospective style video without talking about the gameplay, the visuals, the audio, so that's what I'll use this little miscellaneous section for. Visually, each game is fantastic. It's distorted in this very specific way that makes it give this creepy fairy tale feeling. The designs for each enemy is unique and strange, but it keeps with these themes. Masks, drooping skin, unnatural proportions. There's this spirited away aspect to all of them. They're in this perfect valley of creepy and charming. The same goes with the world. Things don't really make sense. It's too disproportionate, too impractical. But the cartoony nature of everything makes it feel whimsical while also unsettling. It's that clash of the visuals that make it great. And don't even get me started on the camera work. The way it zooms out and pans around gives everything such a cinematic feel. For the audio, they have this really interesting way of melding sounds. For instance, the chef's sound almost sounds like a mix between a whale and a foghorn. It keeps with the themes of the game, but also adds some extra personality and creep factor. The music is great and catchy, a weird mix of charming and unsettling. I have to say though, the original sound for the janitor in Little Nightmares 1 that was in the Hunger trailer is way creepier than the one that ended up in the game. Gameplay wise, it's probably the weakest part of the series. Not that it's bad, it just has some issues. In some ways, the pseudo 2D, 3D platforming thing that's going on has a lot of interesting mechanics and is pretty fun. In other ways, it's frustrating trying to time and position your jumps and accidentally falling happens a lot, especially in the first game. Otherwise though, the game feels nice and intuitive, and usually you have a very clear goal of what you're trying to reach. Simple, but effective. So there you go, Little Nightmares. This one was long, so thank you for sticking around. Ever since the first game came out, it's been one of my favorite games ever. So if you haven't played it already, why don't you give it a try? It's fun, scary, and has a lot of cool moments. Until then, let me know what you thought of this video in the comments and suggest what I should cover next on my Twitter. You should also follow me there because that's when I'm announcing when I'm streaming at twitch.tv forward slash SaganHawks. See you all next time. Thank you to the patrons for supporting the channel.